بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, salutations and greetings be upon our master Muhammad, his family and companions. We ask Allah to grant us beneficial knowledge and to benefit us through what he has already taught us and to grant us knowledge which will bring us closer to him. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِي الْعَظِيمِ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى سَيْدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ جَمَعِينَ وَبَعَدْ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome uh, to our latest session on the refinement of souls of Imam Ibn Atta'illah al-Sakandari rahimahullahu ta'ala wa radhi anhu uh, the great scholar from Egypt who's been taking us on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in looking at ourselves, rectifying our states, preparing for the akhirah looking at our shortcomings, looking at how we can improve our characteristics, uh, how we can improve our worship, how we can do those acts which are um, comprehensive, concise and fruitful. And now he talks uh, a bit more about that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we need to be towards our Lord. And he says a real person is not the one who can shout out in gatherings, uh, rather the real person is the one that shouts at himself, screams at himself and takes it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, you know, you can you can be strong in front of other people, but real strength is in looking at yourself and changing yourself, which is a reflection of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu um, that the shadid, the strong one, is not the one that can wrestle somebody else down physically. But the shadid, the strong person, is the one that controls himself at the time of anger. This is true strength, as the Prophet ﷺ told us. And then he says, he gives an example of the real concern. And it's a recurring theme, but it's important we mention this, um, especially now that we're in Ramadan, uh, and that we are struggling against ourselves, controlling our desires, trying to be that little bit more, uh, you know, adherent to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and disciplined. And he says that, um, somebody who's concerned with this world and is not bothered about the next life is like someone who comes uh, across a lion and a lion approaches him to kill him and he sees that lion but then all of a sudden there's a, a fly flying around so he starts dealing with this fly and thinking you know get out of my way and there's a tiger lion coming to devour him uh, this is the example of the one who's concerned with the dunya and not concerned about the akhirah you know, we're so concerned this thing called the flies, the dunya. And this, the flies even worse than the, the, the dunya is not even worth this fly. Right? The Prophet said, had the to Allah, had the had the world been equal or had any had the worth of the wing of a fly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have not given it to those whom he does not like, to the disbelievers. But because it's not worth even that wing of a fly, and how small and you know insignificant that is. He gives it to everyone. It's not worth anything to Allah. So if we're going to mess about and concern ourselves with the dunya, it's actually a, it's a very good metaphor here, an analogy to think that we're messing about or concerned with something that's worthless. It's not even worth a fly. It's a fly. It's, it's less than that. And yet there's so many other major concerns around us, our akhirah, that we're totally neglectful of. So it's not a good state to be in. The best state, as he says here, for you is to lose this world in order to gain the hereafter. Right? And then he gives some more analogies to help us reflect over this. And I think it's important we, we read this and we reflect over this and we change. You know, we think about how I need to start changing my attitude. Because I think a lot of people today, they think life is about amassing wealth. You know, but what's, what's on the list of life goals and achievements, right? Get house, nice car, get married, have a nice wedding, have children, you know, um, go on holidays, um, have the latest, uh, you know, uh, gadgets phones, laptops, uh, you know, upgrades, whatever it is, right, you know, um, you know, have the latest sort of furniture, carpeting, you know, all this dunya, dunya, dunya. There's nothing wrong in these things, by the way, but that's the goal of life, that is wrong. If that is your purpose in life, just to have these things, that's emptiness. You know, that is really emptiness. And I've come across people, first hand spoken to me, that I've said we've got everything of this world. We've been given a nice car and we can get a better car. We've got a nice house so we could get a better house. And, you know, there's nothing missing. 
but feel like throwing it all away because everything is missing there's no you feel like this car is worthless feel like this house you know we haven't some of us haven't got there yet so we don't feel that some people that have reached there are telling you but they're telling me firsthand it's a very very doomy doom and gloom life very miserable uh, and they are miserable and i've met them and it's not a nice world to live in happiness isn't found in belongings in in physical things that's not happiness happiness is found true happiness is found in building relationships you know sharing life with other people of course the greatest relationship we could ever build and have and everything else will fall into place after that is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what Imam Ta'ala wants us to do think of it like that we're not trying to neglect our dunya and destroy it and not have anything but if that is the only goal we have in life then that is a complete misunderstanding which will result in and consequently we'll have a lot of problems in our lives a lot of you know problems you don't mean here that you'll be poor or you'll be ill problems as in you'll be spiritually uh, you know devoid of something you'll be depressed you'll be uh, anxiety you won't feel comfortable you won't find peace of mind you'll struggle to hold relationships with others and build relationships and uh, some of these people I actually talked to they actually said that the relationship with their families is very distant and very uh, sort of you know fragile and they're not sure where they stand and they actually feel very sad about this they actually feel that you know they want the most th the most the thing they want the most that i've realized is acceptance from others especially the, your own family you know your own parents your own siblings and when they lose that because they've got the dunya or they've just distanced themselves or they've just neglected each other it becomes very painful um, so we don't want to be amongst those people so don't be in a state of dunya 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 and forget about the, the afterlife right thinking about your family for the afterlife think about your own state for the afterlife um so he gives these analogies what are they? he says the best state for you is to lose this world to gain the after hereafter how often have you have uh you lost the hereafter to gain this world right how often have you decided to sacrifice the rewards the blessings the goodness that is stored or would be in store for you in the next life just because you wanted to follow your whims and desires in this life. How awful, your example is, how awful is fear in the heart of a soldier? You know, the courageous soldier's got fear, that's not where it belongs. Your dunya does not belong in your heart. How awful is a grammatical error for a grammarian? You know, if somebody is eloquent, you know, the best of speeches, and he makes mistakes, and grammatically and, and so forth, sounds horrible it sounds worse and it's, it, it shouldn't be in that person a muslim shouldn't have dunya as the goal primary goal in one's heart how awful is the pursuit of this world for the one who feigns abstinence feigns this i don't want the world right uh and how far is such a person from this dun from the akhirah right how 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 ugly is that a true person not someone who nurtures you through his words rather a true person is the one who nurtures you through his gaze so now um, Imam Al-Ta'ala moves on to a point here that we need help from people and we need guidance and we need nurturing and we need looking over, helping. So this is part of life. The Prophet ﷺ was sent as a nurturer, as a guide, as a وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ as a purifier of hearts and that continues through his heirs, through the tradition just as he taught how to pray and we teach how to pray and we learn how to pray. Just as he taught our beliefs and we learn them and we adhere to them. He also taught us spiritual um, you know, struggles and how to overcome our desires and how to be patient and how to be thankful and to um, be content and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need guidance for this. So he says it's been related from Shaykh Abul Abbas al-Mursi who was a teacher and Shaykh of Imam al-Ta'ala al-Sakandari. Uh, he said, if a tortoise nurtures its hatch with its gaze, then likewise a sheikh nurtures his disciples with his gaze. For a tortoise hatches its eggs on land, toward, heads towards the river and gazes as it ha at its hatch. Then Allah nurtures them through its gaze upon, through the gaze of the tortoise, upon its children, upon, upon the you know, newly hatched uh, babies. So he says here, beware lest you leave this abode whilst not having tasted the sweetness of his love. The sweetness of his love is not in food and drink, as even disbelievers and beasts have that in common with you. Instead, join the angels in the sweetness of his remembrance and complete devotion to Allah, because the souls cannot bear the 
dribble of the ego. If they are immersed in the carcass of this world, then they will not be fit to attain presence of Allah because Allah's presence or proximity in the Hadratullah is not accessible for those who are defiled by the impurity of disobedience. So this is something very, very important that we now need to we now need to kind of talk about and make a, a point of inshallah ta'ala. Um, and that is that um, we need to remove heedlessness and we need to bring in our lives dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to control our desires. We need to control our stomachs, Ramadan, control our genitals. We need to control our thoughts. How do we do this? How do we become those who are favoured with this? Those who make the steps to actually do this in our lives. First of all, make dua, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do what will gain you the favour of Allah. So you know when you get up at night and pray two rakats, when you give charity, when you pray for the deceased, when you help somebody in need, these are all ways of attaining the favours of Allah and gaining that strength to overcome oneself, one's ego, prostrate to Allah with humbleness and humility. Um, and very importantly, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this practical step that I think a lot of us need to take. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the doors of his His, his saints, his the scholars, uh, the teachers, those who have been favoured and have attained and reached a level of self-discipline, of good character, of the prophetic sunnah, in both practised both inwardly and outwardly. Because this is how it works. The Prophet himself taught and his heirs continue to teach and we need a connection to them. And, and that connection has to be through sohba, has to be through companionship. Yes, you can learn from a distance, but there has to be some companionship. So you may visit once a year for, or you, you may sit at some gatherings. And then you may receive the communication via, in the past it was letters. And we have, alhamdulillah, we have many letters that great scholars and shuyukh wrote to their students, which benefited and we have recorded now as great pieces of advice. Uh, and they, that's a method, but really the, the connection in presence, in physicality, is what is required. And this is what Imam Ibn Talat actually tells, and I think it's important that we read this section and read it word for word so you understand the, the real importance um, of sitting with scholars and sheikhs. It says, know that the scholars and sages acquaint you with how to present yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to know what to do. Sit with the scholars, sit with the learned, those who know how to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever seen a slave? So giving an example of the olden times, you know, you go to the marketplace and you buy. In those days, they would have slaves. Slaves would be young people sometimes that are, are clueless, very crude, very uneducated, uh, oblivious to the world kind of people. Just there, just physically strong and just able to do things, right? That's They had the physical side of things. They didn't have anything, no learning, no erudition, no... Um, a sense of morals sometimes and hence it's, it's not in the books of fiqh it says a slave shouldn't lead the prayer a slave shouldn't you know it gives special rulings because the generality of slaves were of this category there were of course educated ones there were of course certain ones that were looked after and this is what you want to do you want to buy a slave and that's what you do then he says here um, have you ever seen a slave who is fit to serve his master immediately on being purchased no it wasn't common it was very very rare uh, on the contrary he is given to someone who trains and disciplines him. So he's bought, he's purchased, now he goes to training. This is what you do, this is what you say, this is how you're supposed to do things. Timings, etiquettes, manners. And you know, it's not something they're accustomed to, but they pick up by training, by practice, by guidance. And then it says, he's given to someone who trains and disciplines him, disciplines him, whereupon becoming worthy and learned in the proper etiquette, he is presented before the king before many different people, before his master, etc. Right? Similarly, the disciples of Allah's saints, Allah's awliya, Allah's friends, may Allah be pleased with them, accompany them until they gently nudge the saints, the sheikhs, the teachers, they gently nudge, it says here, them, the students, to Allah's presence, to Allah's proximity. And this is the beauty of learning uh, and teaching and being in the whole process of uh, Islamic education, Islamic training. You know, education is more than just you know reading a book. Education means training. Education means morals. Education means character. You know, we educate in all of these things, and this is the, the this is what our ummah needs today. Truly, today we are lacking in edu Islamic proper Islamic education, genuine Islamic education, which goes back 
with an isnad, with a chain to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are lacking in the amount of teachers we have. We are lacking in the amount of investment we have, the amount of concern we have for ourselves, for our uh, uh, community, for our children. We give them education in all other fields of life and we invest and we sacrifice so much time and efforts. You know, how many times have you heard that a parent drives half an hour to the school and back every morning, an hour's journey to for your child? In the morning and evening, I know people like this and you know people like this. Look at the investment and effort for their academic worldly education. You know, maths is great, English is great, science is great and it will be a benefit, alhamdulillah. And we're not neglecting the importance. But there's nothing greater than knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing greater than worshipping Him and understanding His commands and laws and adhering to them as a primary focus. Without neglecting anything else, but putting so much effort elsewhere and neglecting this is a blemish. You know, we don't have the investment, we don't have the same passion and drive as a whole, as a ummah, as a, as a complete sort of way of life that we do, that we do have towards the dunya. We don't have this. You know, there are a few parents, there are a few Muslims that know the importance of Islamic education, of character, of morals. And you know, the danger is, and I've seen this as well, that young people grow up distant from Islam. They don't know who the Prophet Muhammad is. I've seen this and it's, it's heartbreaking. That you see, you know, very well educated 15, 16, 17 year olds. I mean, highly educated, you know, they've straight A's as they say, their grades were the top of their class, and you know, they're going to the best universities in the world. Yet you they don't know anything about their Prophet Muhammad. They don't they're not even able to read the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, what kind of success is this if you've neglected uh, the, the most primary focuses a Muslim should have in his life. They don't know how to pray some of these people. Yes, wudu, salah is unknown to them. So this is what's going to change that. If we want people to get close to life, we want our lives to be good, like truly good lives. Because we explained before that going down that route doesn't give you anything. It doesn't really give you substance and, and, and a real purpose and, you know, a real kind of being of who you're supposed to be. You know, we're only humans and we're only great if we do what we were created for, and if we actually, uh, act, you know, realize our potential as, as as servants of Allah, our human being, human beings, being servants of Allah, our purpose is worship of Allah, you know, sacrifice for the community, doing well for others, right, and and being good and upright ourselves, and going on this journey. So if we don't have this whole concept of learning and teaching, and going through this process, we are going to lose out massively. So I'd like to say that please support Imam Ghazali Institute. You know, this, these, these are sessions for you and they do work around the US and around internationally uh, holding, uh, you know, seminars and intensives and classes for the benefit of the Ummah. You should be making dua for such organizations. You should be supporting such organizations with your time, volunteering, with your wealth, with setting up more classes, with facilitating for more of your Ummah, of your community. And it's because we fall short, it's because we are lazy, it's because we have supposedly more important, you know, quote unquote, things to do in our lives that we forget about the real purpose and we are destroying ourselves. So he says to finish this now, he says, uh, in this regard, they are like a swimmer teaching a child how to swim. Initially, he accompanies the child until the latter is able to swim by himself. So we need our teachers. We need them to guide us. We, we need that because no child can just be thrown to the river or the, the sea and say, I can swim, right? They need to be accompanied and taught and slowly, slowly build. And when he is accomplished, when this child, when you as a servant of Allah reach a level of accomplishment, then you can not only be a good servant of Allah, not only be improved in yourself, but then you can pass that on to others as well. Then you can be a source of light in your community. So what happens when the child is accomplished? He's pushed out into the sea and left alone. You can fight this world. You know, we need to be independent in ourselves as Muslims, as human beings. And because we don't have that spiritual know-how, that Islamic education and that nurturing is, is, is why we struggle. You know, we're not confident Muslims anymore. You know, never, uh, if you look at the history of Islam, where the Muslims not confident in themselves as Muslims. You know, today our real struggle, our real, you know, in the past there were different challenges for the Muslims. It was probably more, you know, warfare or destruction or, you know, um, sometimes it was intellectual and so forth. Today's struggle really is a lack of spirituality, a lack of, you know, in looking at the inner and lack of confidence of, at who we are as Muslims. And everybody's looking for answers as Muslims. We are struggling to find people stepping forward. So we need to support the ulama. We need to support the great scholars. They need to be given a platform. They need to be pushed forward into 
uh, the mainstream uh, so that the, the attention is given to them but look what's happening now it's, it's very dangerous that people are saying look at these scholars they dress with turbans and traditional clothing they don't know the modern time they don't understand us they're disconnected from us there's Muslims you know putting down the tradition of scholarship putting down the heirs of the prophets alayhi salatu was salam beware of this because we need to promote the ulama we need to give them the platform and they do know the world today they do live in the world today they they eat the same food and drink the same drinks and have the same mobile phones you use all everyone is in, you know we should just because the way they dress just because the way they appear which is traditional we all you know we just detach ourselves from them and say they don't know anything and just because somebody dresses in a particular way we, we stereotype them you know this is real real ignorance you know we've gone back to the olden days of jahiliya that you know the way somebody dresses is a, is a measurement of their piety or their ability to benefit others or not you know we need to open our hearts up and support those who will support the whole world you know it's not through any other way you can ask you can do as much as you want in any field of humanitarianism of you know helping others and doing good and so forth but if you don't put iman into the equation if you don't put islamic morals into the equation if you don't put the etiquettes of the prophet sallallahu and the sunnah you will have no success people are doing this you know but they reject the prophet sallallahu you know, it's not just doing good that is what is required of us. It's to believe in the ladina amanu amilu salihati. That the ones who believe and do pious deeds, the ones who believe in Allah and His Messenger and do pious deeds. It's not because of just doing good. We need to have ability on Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, and the Quran and our beliefs as Muslims. And may Allah give us the success, the ability, the tawfiq, the guidance to go to His uh, chosen slaves, to sit with them, to learn from them to honor them and ennoble them and to be ennobled by them and to be um, you know, lifted by their presence and by their teachings and by the guidance that they give us. Allah forgive us for the shortcomings we have both in ourselves, in our helping others and may Allah give us the tawfiq to be strong and improved during this month of Ramadan to support the ulama, to support those who teach this deen, the Islamic seminaries uh, and we ask Allah to give us strength to become better Muslims throughout this month of Ramadan. We thank you for listening and being a part of this. Jazakumullah khairan wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.